prehistoric temple aligned with the movements of the sun. Built in stages between 3000 and 2200 BC, it's the only stone circle in the world to have lintels, the horizontal stone sitting on top of the uprights. Its architecture reveals the sophisticated minds and engineering ability of those who built it, the late Neolithic people of Britain. On this tour, we'll not only find out about Stonehenge, but also the history of the landscape around it. Stonehenge was the centre of a ritual landscape that included prehistoric monuments and burial mounds dating from before, during and after Stonehenge was built. While our visit will take you close to the stones, we won't be entering the circle itself. That's because the archaeology below the grass is very fragile. Too much foot traffic causes erosion and damage. The information you'll hear today is based upon years of scientific research. Yet some mysteries about Stonehenge remain. We still don't know why it was built, or exactly how it was used. But we'll hear some different theories, so you can decide for yourself. All of the landscaping work you see will be complete by summer 2014. The project, led by English Heritage, will return a sense of context and dignity to this ancient marvel of human endeavour. Allowing visitors to enjoy the special atmosphere of the stone circle with fewer distractions from modern day sights and sounds. Now, let's step into the story of Stonehenge. The old Stonehenge car park and visitor facilities that you can see behind the temporary fences are being removed and the area will be returned to grass. Built at the same time. Instead, the monument was built and rearranged over a period of about a thousand years. Take a look about 10 meters away, between where you're standing and the stones. You'll see a grass-covered ditch with a bank rising behind it. The ditch and bank run in a complete circle and were built during the first phase of construction, about 5,000 years ago, in around 3000 BC. This was 500 years before the large stones in the center of Stonehenge were raised. Together, this bank and ditch form an early type of henge, this is a term from the name Stonehenge used by archaeologists to describe an earthwork monument surrounded by a bank and ditch. Henges are usually circular, and this one is about 100 metres or 300 feet in diameter. Strictly speaking, henges have their ditches inside the bank, but here at Stonehenge, the ditch is actually on the outside, so it isn't actually a true henge. Now, keep following the path while you hear about how the henge was made. The ditch was dug using picks made from deer antlers. Some of these are on display in the exhibition at the visitor center. The chalk was then piled up to build an inner bank and probably also an outer one. Originally, the entire circle would have been chalk white. When the builders finished the enclosure, they placed animal bones, flint tools, and carved chalk objects into the ditch, perhaps as offerings. Inside the ditch was a ring of 56 holes, which held either stone or timber pillars. Many of these holes contained cremated human remains. An estimated 150 people were buried here between about 3000 and 2800 BC. So in its earliest phase, Stonehenge was a cemetery. Just before the bridge, you might be able to see a stone lying flat on the ground. This is the Slaughter Stone. Turn your back to Stonehenge and look at the large leaning stone to your left. Like all the large stones, it's a type of sandstone called sarsen. But unlike the stones you'll see in the circle, it hasn't been shaped and remains in its natural state. It may have been lying near here, perhaps the earliest stone on the site. It's known as the heel stone. The name might come from the fact that it heals or leans to one side or it might have come from the Greek, Helios, referring to the sun. The heel stone stands along an important pathway. If the grass isn't too high, you might be able to make out a pair of raised parallel banks and ditches on either side of it. They form a corridor about 20 meters wide. This is the final section of what's called the avenue. It was the entrance to Stonehenge processional route that stretched nearly three kilometers, or about two miles, to the banks of the River Avon. The avenue was probably built in about 2300 BC, after the stones were raised. The people who constructed Stonehenge aligned the earthwork entrance and later the avenue 
with the movements of the sun. If you were standing inside the stone circle, facing the avenue on Midsummer's Day, or summer solstice, you'd see the sun rise over the heelstone. Similarly, if you were standing by the heelstone on Midwinter's Day, or winter solstice, you'd watch the sun set to the left of the tallest upright with the bump, or tenon, on top. It once had a partner stone and a horizontal lintel that, together, would have framed the sunset. As you cross the bridge, you may have spotted an arrow on the ground. This marks the line of the solstice. Stonehenge's alignment shows that its builders had a sophisticated understanding of the sky. The seasons would have been very important to these prehistoric people. The winter would have been a difficult time. They needed the return of longer days and warmth to grow their crops and feed their animals. Perhaps Stonehenge was a sort of calendar, or a place where the seasons were celebrated. The stones were raised into place in about 2500 BC, during a time we call the Late Neolithic period. People at this time probably led somewhat nomadic lifestyles, moving with the seasons, herding pigs and cattle, and returning regularly to the same places. English heritage archaeologist Susan Greeney tells us how their pottery gives us an insight into their culture. So we know that the people who built the stone monument at Stonehenge were using a type of pottery called grooved ware pottery. This is a particularly decorative type of pottery with a flat bottom. And that type of pottery is found all over Britain, and it's actually developed first in Orkney, in the far north of Scotland. So we know that these people had connections to other parts of Britain and Ireland, and they were probably quite well travelled. We don't know how society was organised at this time, but it took hundreds of people from across Britain to build Stonehenge. More people would have been needed to move the stones, provide equipment, and to feed and shelter the workers. Professor Mike Parker Pearson has a theory about Stonehenge's role as a memorial, and its link to another prehistoric site, Durrington Walls, about three kilometres or two miles away. We think that Durrington Walls and Stonehenge were part of one complex in the third millennium BC, and the link was basically that each of them has an avenue leading to the River Avon. At Durrington Walls, archaeologists discovered the remains of houses. You might have seen reconstructions of them outside the visitor centre. Durrington might have been a workers' camp for the thousands of people who built Stonehenge. Among the houses stood a circle aligned with the movements of the sun. But this circle was made from timber. It gave Parker Pearson the clues to Stonehenge's purpose. The breakthrough came from inviting a colleague from Madagascar in the Indian Ocean to look at Stonehenge. And he said, what do you mean you don't know what it's for? It's obvious. Because for him in Madagascar, you build in stone for the ancestors because they are permanent. But you build in timber for the living. Parker Pearson believes that Durrington Walls, with its houses and wood structures, was the domain of the living, whereas Stonehenge, with its cremations and stones, functioned as the domain of the dead. It's one of several theories about Stonehenge that keeps archaeologists exploring and debating. What do you think? As you walk around, you might be able to see a small sarsen just inside the bank. It's known as a station stone. Originally, there were four station stones marking the corners of a rectangle. If you were to draw a line between opposite corners of this rectangle, they would meet at the exact centre of Stonehenge. The station stones were probably put in place around the same time as the Sarsens, around 2500 BC. Their meaning is still a mystery. They may have served as survey markers for Stonehenge's original builders, or they may have marked particular phases and movements of the moon at various times during the year. Today, only two of the original four station stones remain. This one, and one on the other side of the stone circle. What makes Stonehenge unique is the arrangement of its stones, and the fact that they were brought from long distances. There are two kinds of stones. The larger ones are sarsens, a type of hard sandstone, probably brought from the Marlborough Downs, 30 kilometers or 19 miles away. Sarsens can weigh over 30 tons. The tallest one here stands over seven meters high, with another two and a half meters below ground. The smaller stones inside the circle, still weighing up to three tons, are called blue stones. They're actually a variety of volcanic rock, 
all with a blue-grey colour. They were brought from the Preseli Hills in southwest Wales, over 240 kilometres, or 156 miles away. How were these heavy stones brought here? Susan Greeney, English heritage archaeologist, explains. They were bought by a system of using probably rollers, wooden rollers and wooden sledges to drag stones over land and also probably along rivers and over the sea by use of simple boats and rafts. The ones from the Marlborough Downs were bought entirely over land, so that would have entailed huge amounts of timber, large amounts of ropes and huge amounts of people to drag the stones over the countryside to Stonehenge. The sarsens on the outside of the monument are part of what was probably a complete circle. Some of the uprights still have their horizontal stones or lintels on top. Inside, you can see some even larger stones. These once formed a horseshoe of five trilithons. A trilithon, from the Greek for three stones, is made of two upright stones and one horizontal lintel. Some of these have now fallen. As you continue round the circle, see if you can spot the smaller blue stones among the sarsens. For centuries, the barrows around Stonehenge remained untouched. But in the 18th and 19th centuries, they attracted the first archaeologists, called antiquaries. Antiquaries often dug straight down into a barrow's central burial to find the valuable items inside. Pottery, jewellery and weapons. While they added these to their personal collections, they left the human remains behind as these interested them less. In the early 19th century, antiquaries Sir Richard Colt Hoare and William Cunnington dug into more than 200 barrows in the landscape around Stonehenge. Their most spectacular discovery was a rich burial inside a barrow known as Bush Barrow. If it's a clear day, look beyond the main road and see if you can spot a mound with a small bush growing on it. That is the Bush Barrow. Inside, Hoare and Cunnington found a man buried with many rich objects, including two lozenge-shaped sheets of gold, a gold belt plate, and a fine bronze dagger decorated with gold pins. As very few round barrows have been excavated in recent times, modern archaeologists rely on the antiquaries' records to interpret and understand these early Bronze Age burials from 4,000 years ago. Today, Many of the finds from Barrows, including those from Bush Barrow, are on display at Wiltshire Museum in Devizes. In 1978, archaeologists were excavating a small section of the ditch. Unexpectedly, they discovered the skeleton of a man. Radiocarbon dating of his bones tells us that he died around 2300 BC, after the sarsen stones had been raised, and roughly contemporary with the construction of the first round barrows. The man was about 30 years old when he died. He was buried with a wrist guard, a small rectangle of stone that was probably strapped to his upper arm, and several flint arrowheads. He was therefore named the Stonehenge Archer. But the arrowheads didn't all belong to him. Several of them were embedded in his ribs and sternum, or breastbone, suggesting that he'd met with a violent death. We don't know if he was a sacrifice or a victim of an attack, but the fact that he was buried at Stonehenge suggests that his life, or perhaps his death, was very important. Look over to your right. And about 50 metres, or about 150 feet away, you'll see a large grass-covered mound. This is a round barrow. Look out from Stonehenge in almost any direction, and you'll spot more of them. There are some on a ridge, called King Barrow Ridge, beyond this nearby barrow. And there are more on the other side of the busy main road, in an area called Normanton Down. Round barrows were built after construction activities at Stonehenge had finished, from about 2300 BC until about 1600 BC. Many of these mounds were placed along the ridges overlooking Stonehenge, indicating that the monument remained an important site long after building work was complete. There are more than 300 mounds within a three kilometer or two mile radius of Stonehenge, one of the highest concentrations in Britain. Each barrow covered the graves of what we assume were prominent people, the earliest barrows contained burials, 
Later, some covered cremations. Often, the person was buried with spectacular grave goods, including stone, bone and bronze tools, pottery, ceremonial battle axes, and ornaments made from exotic materials, like jet, amber and gold. Some of these finds are on display in the visitor center. Often, several burials can be located beneath a single barrow, as Susan Greeny explains. They might have had a burial, for example, or surrounded by a ring of posts. Then they might have put a mound over that. Then they might have put another burial in and then enlarged the mound and dug a ditch around it. So what we see when we look at the little round mound is really the last stage in their history. When these barrows were first built, the chalk would have gleamed white against the grass. Stonehenge is a circular monument, so it may surprise you to hear that you're looking at the back. Quite a lot of sarsens are missing from this side, and those that remain aren't as carefully shaped as the ones closer to the avenue. Susan Greeny tells us why. This is probably because the back side of the monument wasn't quite so important for the builders of Stonehenge, and they seem to have not dressed the stones quite so carefully, and they may have used slightly shorter stones than they needed, or chose slightly more irregular stones for this back portion, and that suggests that the back wasn't so important to be seen as from the front. Some archaeologists think that the stone circle may not have been completed at all. Some of the stones seem too narrow or short to have supported lintels. The stones on this side, which probably wasn't built so well, were the first to fall over. Some must have been broken up and taken away. People were taking the stones just as a useful source of building material because Salisbury Plain in particular doesn't have really any stones readily available. An advantage to viewing Stonehenge from this less complete side is that you have a good view of the inner horseshoe and some of the smaller blue stones. Take a few moments to look for the various types of stone structures. The sarsen trilithons, two uprights supporting a lintel, bumps called tenons that once slotted into holes in the lintels, and the smaller blue stones. You're also standing roughly on the solstice axis of the monument, facing towards the northeast, where the sun rises in midsummer. The stones weren't always in the arrangement you see today, however. The sarsens and blue stones were first set up in 2500 BC. Once they were raised, they weren't moved, but the blue stones were rearranged, and perhaps more than once. They were placed in their current positions by about 2200 BC. People have been investigating the archaeology of Stonehenge since the 17th century. One of the earliest surveys was undertaken by the antiquary John Aubrey, who discovered a ring of depressions inside the ditch. These are now named Aubrey Holes in his honour. In the early 18th century, William Stukeley surveyed Stonehenge and other monuments in the landscape. He discovered the avenue and realised that it was aligned with the midsummer sunrise. In the 1870s, the renowned Egyptologist William Flinders Petrie made the first accurate plan of Stonehenge. He also created the numbering system for the stones that archaeologists still use today. The first scientific excavations took place in 1901, led by archaeologist William Gowland. He discovered hammer stones, round stones used to smash pieces off larger rocks, and antler picks, both of which suggested to him that Stonehenge was built before the arrival of metal tools in Britain. Large-scale excavations were undertaken over two main periods in the 20th century, in the 1920s and again in the 1950s and 60s. This work led to the idea that Stonehenge had been built in three stages and enabled the first scientific dating of the site to take place. Nearly half of Stonehenge has now been excavated, and work continues on analysing the results of the most recent excavations. We're constantly learning new things about this extraordinary place. Often, when people think of Stonehenge, they think of the Druids, ancient priests who were living in Britain at the time the Romans arrived in AD 43. From the classical sources that describe them, these Iron Age priests worshipped in sacred oak groves, practising a pagan religion that honoured nature but also involved sacrifices. In the 17th century, the antiquary John Aubrey suggested that Stonehenge predated the Roman period. At the time, the only known pre-Roman people were the Druids, so Aubrey logically concluded that Stonehenge was one of their temples. This idea was championed by 18th century antiquary William Stukeley, 
and remained the accepted explanation until the end of the 19th century. Victorian visitors even named one of the stones the Slaughter Stone, in the mistaken belief that Druid priests used it during sacrifices. In actual fact, the Druids had nothing to do with Stonehenge. It was built over 2,000 years earlier than the Iron Age cultures described by the classical authors. Since the early 20th century, modern-day Druids have been coming to Stonehenge. They consider it a sacred place and gather here at different times each year to celebrate, including the midsummer and midwinter solstices. They're not the only ones to feel a spiritual bond with Stonehenge, as Susan Greeny explains. A lot of modern people have a spiritual connection to Stonehenge. They see it as a particularly special place where we, as modern people, can link to our ancestors, to the distant past. People like to come and celebrate uh, midwinter solstice and see themselves as carrying on a special tradition that's happened there for thousands of years. Many of these people would call themselves druids, others might call themselves pagans, others are just spiritually aware people. Some people just come to help watch and see the spectacle. Take a look just inside the bank of the earthwork enclosure. You should see a marker set into the path and two more in the grass on either side. These show the position of three holes dug about 5,000 years ago. 500 years before the stones arrived. These holes were part of a ring of 56 pits that extends around Stonehenge. Each pit probably held a pillar, although we're not sure whether they were standing stones or wooden posts. Inside and around these holes, archaeologists have discovered the cremated remains of about 64 people. They have been as many as 150 people originally buried here. They were mostly men, but there were some women and children as well and all probably important people. Only a few other cremation cemeteries from this period are known in Britain, and Stonehenge is the largest. These holes are known as Aubrey Holes, after 17th century antiquary John Aubrey. He was the first person to notice some of these holes, which appeared as depressions, although they weren't excavated for another 250 years. The holes remind us that Stonehenge was an important ritual site long before the stones arrived. When we look at Stonehenge today, we're seeing it as a ruin, altered by more than 4,000 years of weather and human behaviour. Take a look at the bases of the standing sarsens in this area. As you move around, you might see that one of them is supported by a concrete block. The repair has been intentionally left visible, and they're part of the site's history. Although the sarsens and bluestones look solid, several of them have fallen over the centuries. From the 1880s, several leaning stones were propped up with timber poles. When a sarsen upright and its lintel toppled in 1900, visitor safety became a concern, and the dangerously leaning tallest stone was set back upright. After the site was taken into the care of the nation in 1918, the Office of Works undertook a major program of restoration, resetting many of the stones in concrete to make them more secure. This work continued in the 1950s and 1960s, when further stones were restored upright. For years, all visitors were allowed to enter the stone circle, but access had to be restricted in 1978 due to vandalism and graffiti. Susan Greeny explains why that's still the case today. The challenge really for English Heritage who look after Stonehenge is to balance conserving this unique world heritage site and in particular this unique monument against the wishes of the millions of people who really want to come and see it every year. And this is the reason why we can't let everybody who visits Stonehenge into the middle of the stone circle. If we let the million people in every year, the ground would soon turn to mud, it would erode very quickly, and some of the fragile archaeology under the ground would be damaged. Only about half of Stonehenge has been excavated. And so there's still half a monument there that has never been excavated and is probably waiting with secrets to tell us in the future. Even if in the future, with new techniques and science, archaeologists uncover some of those secrets, some things about Stonehenge will remain mysterious. But the monument will always provide a direct link to the distant past and to the prehistoric people we hope to better understand. Now that you've listened to the tour, make sure you take off your headphones. Spend some time soaking up 
the atmosphere. Take in the landscape around you and look again at Stonehenge. What message do you think the prehistoric people who built it were trying to convey 4,500 years ago? What does Stonehenge mean to you? Whatever you believe, this extraordinary monument allows us all to feel a connection to the deep past. century antiquarian and clergyman William Stukeley pioneered archaeological investigations of prehistoric monuments. His fascination with Stonehenge and the landscape led him to recognize the prehistoric avenue and cursus. He also discovered Stonehenge's alignment on the midsummer sunrise. Stukeley was greatly inspired by another antiquarian, John Aubrey, whose unpublished theory stated that Stonehenge was pre-Roman and had been built by the Druids. It was to have a lasting effect on him. During the 17th century, there was no concept of a long prehistory. The earliest known people were the pre-Roman Celts or Gauls. Therefore, it was logical to assume that the Druids, the religious leaders of these people, built and worshipped at Stonehenge. Stukeley published his findings. Stonehenge, a temple restored to the British Druids in 1740, and was convinced that prehistoric Druids practiced an early form of pure Christianity. He even began to style himself as a Druid. It was a popular and accepted theory until the end of the 19th century, when archaeologists realized Stonehenge was much older than Stukeley thought. However, the association between Druids and Stonehenge has endured to this day. <laughs>